Welcome to the exam review of the UK Actuarial Profession CT6 exam paper for October 2015. I'm John Lee, a tutor from ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. In this video, I'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper. If you'd like more detailed solutions, then refer to our ASET, ASET, which stands for ACTED Solutions and Exam Technique, which give both model and alternative solutions as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from our eStore in time for students' preparation for the April 2016 exam. OK, the paper kicks off asking us for the number of simulations we'll need in order to estimate the true proportion to within 0 0.01 with 99% confidence. Well, this is testing errors from Chapter 14 of the notes and is actually the fifth time we've been asked a question on this. However, it might have been easy to get confused here since we're asked about the proportion, and you may think it's about proportional errors. The yi's are an indicator function, and if we find the mean of the yi's, that will give us the proportion of claims which exceed m. So we are doing an absolute error question. So you could either just recall the formula, or you could have just worked with the central limit theorem. Question 2 tests bookwork from chapter 7, and whilst we've had a couple of questions on bookwork, we've not actually tested this area before. It asks about the simplifications of the model. That's not the assumptions about the n and the xi, nor is it asking about the attributes of general insurance products like their premium and claim renewal, nor is it asking us about the characteristics such as a fixed period and long tails, nor is it asking us about essential or desirable conditions for a risk to be insurable. Unfortunately, many students got confused and gave the book work from those other areas. What we're after here is the fact that we ignore interest and expenses and assume claims are settled immediately. And of course, we actually know the claims distribution. The second part give two examples of forms of insurance. It's simply saying something like travel insurance or motor insurance or home insurance, which should have been no bother at all. Question three is on decision theory from chapter one and marks the third time we've been asked a question on zero sum games, the last being in April. Part 1 asks us to explain why the above can be thought of a zero-sum two-person game. Well, no prizes for saying there's two companies. But zero-sum simply means that if you add up the profit and the loss, it is zero. So as long as you said something along the lines of what one company loses, the other company gains, you would have been fine. In part 2, it asks us to explain what is meant by a randomised strategy, which would have presented no bother unless you answered a different question, which is why are they using a randomised strategy? And part three, we have to determine the strategy. Again, notice the action word. Determine means the examiners require working. Simply giving the answer would not have gained you any marks. To do this would have required our table of profits. Don't get caught out here. We're told that Raspberry captures 70% of the total profits if they adopt the same approach. But then it tells us robots gets 80% if Raspberry is cautious. And so obviously Raspberry will get 20% and similarly for the final figure. It's now a standard question from the notes where you assign probability p to cautious, 1 minus p to aggressive, and calculate the expected profits for each option robots, limited takes, and then set them equal. Question 4, test Bayesian estimation from chapter 2 of the notes. And we're asked to calculate an estimate for the proportion theta in favour of independence. They don't tell us what distribution the sample data comes from, but given that we're talking about proportion, and you can either support independence or not, it's fairly obvious it should be a binomial distribution. We're then told to use a suitable uniform distribution. Well, given that we're estimating proportion, theta must take a value between 0 and 1, and so we need to use a uniform 0 1. Part 2 of the question, we'll use a beta prior, and we're asked to obtain the estimate under all or nothing loss, which will be the mode of that. That should be no bother. Don't forget to check, though, that you do actually have a maximum. Question 5 tests credibility theory from Chapter 5 of the notes. And here it's the normal normal model. Well, given that there are three major models that we use, and this is one of them, this should have been no bother at all for well-prepared candidates, especially since the result is given in the tables. This was asked, asked in April 2012, question 5. However, notice the action word. Part 1 asks us to derive the posterior distribution and not simply state it from the tables. Question 6 is on generalised linear models from chapter 10 of the notes. And it's a bookwork question. 
Part 1 asks us to explain what is meant by a saturated model, and since this is two marks, you need to say two things. So yes, it has as many parameters as there are data observations, but don't forget to mention it's also a perfect fit. Part 2 book work is stating the definition of the scale deviance, but don't forget to define all the terms in your formula. And part 3 we're chatting about residuals. So we're defining the Pearson and deviance residuals, and then mentioning the fact that Pearson residuals are great for normal distributions, but skewed to jiggery for other distributions. Question 7 tests the EBCT model 2 from chapter 6 of the notes, which is surprising since we had a question on this in the April paper. This question is actually identical, except for the numbers, to September 2012 question 8, but we have ships rather than buildings, and should have presented absolutely no bother at all to any well-prepared student. All the formulae we require are in the tables, and the yij over pij will simply give us the claims per ship, which are the xijs. And so these columns correspond to the various bits we need in our formulae in the tables. However, don't get caught out. Our formula for the credibility premium is per unit of risk volume, or in this question, per ship, and we're told there are 100 ships of type 3. So you'll need to multiply your answer by 100. Part 2 of the question asks for an advantage and disadvantage of using Model 1, which is just straightforward bookwork. Question 8 tests the Bornhotter-Ferguson method for runoff triangles from Chapter 11 of the Notes, which again was also tested in April, so it would have been very familiar to any student who'd looked at past papers. Again, we're only asked to calculate this for 2014, and we get an astonishing 9 marks. This should have been easy money. However, don't miss out the fact that we're asked to state the assumptions underlying this model. Question 9 seems to have got lost from a subject CT3 exam paper. We're asked to derive the MGF of a gamma distribution and then derive the coefficient of skewness. Neither of these topics are explicitly covered in the CT6 notes, although we have in the past been asked the coefficient of skewness for the collective risk model. So it's 11 marks for doing subject CT3, which would have been no bother at all, unless of course you've got an exemption and have forgotten your CT3. The definition of an MGF is that it's the expectation of e to the tx, so we'll do the integral of e to the tx times the PDF. This won't be straightforward unless you use a clever trick, which is to make it look like another gamma distribution. We can then use the fact that we're integrating this PDF of the new gamma over the full range, which will give us 1. The easiest way of obtaining the coefficient of skewness is to take the MGF, which if you couldn't have derived, you could have just got from the tables, and then log it to get the CGF. Differentiating this three times and substituting in T as zero would have given you the skewness, and then you would have divided that by the variance of the 1.5, which would have been an incredibly easy eight marks, if you could have remembered how to do it. Question 10 tests adjustment coefficients from chapter nine of the notes. In this question, claims are uniformly distributed, which is a little bit messy. It's fairly standard stuff to obtain the premium and the MGF. However, solving the equation will be quite messy, which is why we're simply asked to show that its value is 0 0.0066. You may be tempted to just simply substitute that in both sides and show that they're equal. However, the question specifies that we need to show that this is correct to four decimal places. And so we have to use a fairly standard method that we've used in previous CT6 papers, which is to substitute in values either side and show the solution is between them, and so it must be 0 0.0066 to four decimal places. In the next part, we now add excess of loss reinsurance, which makes things a little messier. First, we need to calculate the mean amount paid by the reinsurer, which would have been no bother, unless of course you got confused and thought the limits were between m and infinity, whereas since we have a uniform distribution between zero and 50, the upper limit must be 50. Once we've got E of Z, we need the minimum retention level to ensure that the insurer's net premium is more than their expected net claims. This is fairly standard stuff and simply requires that we calculate E of Y. And since we've calculated E of Z already, we could just do E of X and subtract E of Z. Rearranging it will give you a quadratic, which can be solved to give two solutions, only one of which can be correct since our uniform distributions between zero and 50 our retention limit must also therefore be between 0 and 50. Part 3 of the question was an explain part and required us to understand what's going on. 
we've got a lower reinsurance premium loading, which means it's cheaper to pass claims on to the reinsurer, which is what we'd expect the insurer to do. And so the retention limit will drop so that more claims get passed on. Question 11 is where this paper got quite messy. We're testing a vector time series here and asked to determine the values for which we get a stationary time series. This was last asked in April 2008, question 9. However, unlike that question, we have a matrix in front of our xt, yt vector. Well, let's go through this a little bit more carefully. Rewriting in the notation should have presented no bother. We simply rearrange the equations to obtain the t terms on the left hand side and the t minus 1 terms on the right hand side. Then the coefficients will give us the matrices we require. Now, in order to match up with the notes, we need just the xt, yt vector on the left hand side. So, how do we get rid of a matrix? Well, no worries, we just multiply through by its inverse. Well, would have been no worries if you remembered how to work out inverses, which is assumed knowledge for the actual exams and is covered in our FAC course. Doing so would have given you the following matrix, and then recall for it to be stationary, we require its eigenvalues, which we obtain by finding the determinant of the matrix, which we'll call A, take away lambda of the identity matrix, and set that equal to zero. And then we need those eigenvalues to be less than one in magnitude. At worst, supposing you couldn't get those matrices right, you'd still get follow through marks for obtaining the eigenvalues of whatever matrix you did have in front of it. Part two is a totally separate question, and so you could have scored here even if you couldn't do anything on part one, where we simply have to rewrite it as a vector autoregressive time series and specify its order. Looking at the terms, you'll have an xt, yt vector on the left hand side and two other vectors on the right hand side which is a var2, and you simply have to specify what the matrices are to obtain all your marks. The final question on the paper tests both the inverse transform method and the acceptance rejection method from chapter 14 of the notes. Well, this is fairly standard stuff, except that our function is split into two parts. Now, we have had something a bit similar to this before when we had the double exponential function back in April 2011, question 6. So let's just take this a little bit carefully. First of all, we have to calculate the value of k. Well, no worries here. We know that total probabilities are 1, so we just have to integrate the PDF and set it equal to 1. In part 2, we need the inverse transform method, and so we're going to need to calculate the CDF so we can set it equal to our value from a uniform 0, 1 and invert it to get the value of x. But our CDF will have to be in two parts. The first part will be for values of x between 0 and 2, and so we'll just integrate the first part of the PDF. The second part will be values of x greater than 2, but don't forget we'll need to add on the integral of the first part to get the full probability. Once you have this, rearranging it shouldn't be too much bother. Part 3 asks us to set out the algorithm for using the acceptance rejection method, and we're told to use samples from an exponential distribution with mean 1. So this is our h of x. We know that the next step is to obtain our value of c, which is the maximum of the function we want, divided by our h of x. But because our PDF is in two parts, we'll need to work out the maximum for each part of the PDF and see which is the biggest, and take that as our value of c. Once we've got our c, we can substitute it in to obtain our g of x, which is the probability of accepting our value of x. Again, we'll have two functions for g of x, to give the probabilities of accepting x from each of the two parts of our PDF. But messy, but still got some standard stuff in there. If you wish to chat with your fellow students about this paper, then feel free to post on our forums at www.acted.co.uk forward slash forums. Also on the screen now are links to videos from our Stats Refresher course for those who got a CT3 exemption and need a bit more help, and a sample from our CT6 online classroom if you'd like some extra help but are not able to obtain face-to-face -face tuition. Thanks for watching.